I'm Andrew Billings. I'm David Hogan. Welcome to Formation. <laughs> I'm here with someone that I've looked up to for a long time and that's been a huge influence in my life, Brother David Hogan, missionary in Mexico for 40-something, 40 46 years, I think, and uh, to date. And, uh, you know, just we've built a relationship over the years and it's someone that, like I said, I hugely look up to. And what we wanted to do today is just really talk about um, maybe a topic that people don't really feel free to talk about or people don't really go down the trail I was sharing this morning when we were talking just about growing up in church and you only hear sometimes the good stories and you hear sometimes the successes and people's victories, but people don't sometimes talk about their brokenness or their pain. And so today we want to talk about some of that stuff and we're going to go down the road of talking about how to walk out and survive pain and suffering because even Jesus told us in this life, you're going to have troubles. I'm with you, but you're going to have troubles. And so just that whole idea in Isaiah 53, you know, it, it tells us that Jesus is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And sometimes that doesn't correlate with some of the messages of victory and triumph and breakthrough that we hear, which are part of the gospel, but we can't exclude the other part that actually tells us we're well advised. Even Paul tells us you're going to have trials and testings. It's coming for you and it's, and it's coming in sometimes hot and strong. And so we want to talk a little bit about it. And we're going to bounce off each other a little bit and just really go down a road of talking about pain and suffering in the journey of following Jesus. So, you want to you want to kick off on that? You want to? Yeah, I will. <laughs> um, uh, for me, it's a like you, you well know. I do conferences all over the world, and people want to hear the victory. Uh, they want to live in a. Disney World atmosphere of life uh, with free rides, free cotton candy. <laughs> it's not that way in my world. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of things I would like to say about that. Um, I got a, we have lots, of, I work with uh, 28 Indian tribes in Mexico. Um, and I've been faithful to the call of God to try to bring the gospel of peace to the poor. That's what I like. I like doing that. Yep. It's important to me to bring to people that don't have a chance. It doesn't matter to me what ethnicity. It doesn't matter to me what tribe. It matters that God gives us an open door. Yeah. And we go in and try to access the power and energy of heaven for that people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was in this village, right? And this, I made I made headway with these folks. Uh, lots of people got saved. Uh, it's looking like uh, God's fixing to take over the the negative, run the witchcraft off, run the idolatry off, and we're going to live in a utopia atmosphere. But it turns out that that's, uh, that's some sort of dream that I believe people thought up for it. It may turn out to be a money-making idea or a power idea how to control folks. Right. Uh, I'm not going to accuse anyone. It's not my goal. My goal is to tell you what happened to us. Right. So I get these young people going. They start forming into leadership. I am too. I'm young as well. And so these kids get married. Life's going well. People are being healed. And we're thinking, wow, this is awesome. But then I get a note one morning. It, we didn't. We don't have the cell phones and that sort of idea where I live. There's no signal. Uh, so it's called a recado. It's a written, handwritten note. Mm by an educated person. <clears throat> and so it says, I need you come quick. So uh, it's not where we live. It's not, uh, there's no interstates. It's not accessible. It's, everything's slow moving. It's mountain, four wheel drive. So it's, it's a different idea. Come quick, it has a different idea. But I eventually made it. And when I got there, okay. 
this young minister, his wife, the first baby, and the baby was stillborn. Mm. Okay. That's, <clears throat> I mean, I don't have any experience with, uh, with uh, trying to talk or help uh, a person make it through such a heavy negative idea because death is seriously negative to us, how we view it. Okay, so when I when I come in there, he brought me in. I didn't, I, I mean, it's a it's a bamboo hut, it's a dirt floor. Uh, as far as wh- how we view life, it's already hard. But now we add death of a firstborn child, and the wife. Uh, didn't clean up. She still has placenta inside of her, and there's no way. To, there's nowhere to take her. There's no right. hospital. Okay, so things are completely out of control. <clears throat> All right. So how do you? How do you not lose them? How do you? Because I go in preaching the gospel, preaching the promises, preaching the blessing. And our first reward is death. Okay, that's that's a, uh, putting it lightly, that's a bumpy way to start a relationship. Mm. Oh, <clears throat> because I'm a longevity thinking human being. Yep. Okay, so. So, man, he, he folded up his Bible. Handed me back the Bible I had given him. He says, if this is the gospel, I'm out. And I I didn't believe it was the gospel. I I believe it was a robbery. I do believe that we were hijacked. I I do believe that, okay? But how do you compensate life, godliness, Victorious living, and when when the first thing thrown at you is death, right? Okay, so I, I'm I try to live a an honest, real life. I do. So I said to him, I said, I don't need you to do that. He said, It doesn't matter. Uh, this this is too hard. I'm not interested in this type of life. And so he handed me the Bible back, and boy, that was disappointing. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of things going on at once here, you know. Of course, the, of course, the, the 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 priority is the loss of the baby, and now the wife's dying. Right. And now he's quitting the gospel. Yep. And I do understand why he is, and I don't, I don't have any way to talk him out of it because he's right. I uh, apologize to all anybody that's listening. You don't want to hear this. I know you don't. You only want to hear about the dead raising. And there is that. We do have that. But to me, only speaking of victory is a false doctrine. Yes. It's, it's an unbalanced life. Yeah. Because death is part of what we do. Just like life is. Okay. So, and I'm inexperienced. I don't have a whole lot of energy uh, or time in the, in the walk. I do have some, but not, not dealing with death as much. And so, I'm sitting there thinking, and he is really coming off on me. I mean, he's pretty aggressive, you know. And, and he should be. He, should, he shouldn't hold the animosity and the anger, he should express his heart. He should be able to offload the negative energy because it's his firstborn, and I I do get it, actually, because that's what God did for us. Yeah. Okay, so so I'm sure, you know, some 
theologian or some doctor of theology could, you know, give me a whole bunch of verses on how I should manage him, what I should do and say, and there should be courses on how to manage people through death experiences and uh but when you're sitting there in a in a dirt floor environment and this guy's bawling and uh, they don't show their emotions anyway and you know and his manhood is violated his family's violated his you know his christianity and he's right, actually. So I sit there and let him vent for a long time. And then I, God gave me an idea about the great cloud of witnesses. Mm. And so I looked it up in Hebrews and shared it with him. I said, now listen, I cannot force the gospel on you. I did not know we were going to have to face this this soon, but life is a- absolutely negative and positive. And I want, I want to be honest and let you know that I can't promise you that this is not going to happen. I can promise you that it will happen. Right. And I can promise you, though, that God is with us regardless of how rough and sour life may turn toward us, yep. he, his love for us is genuine. It's safe. It's not, it's not, uh, he's not against us. Hell is against us. Yeah. The discouragement and the negative is coming from the enemy, not God. That's right. hundred percent. And so I, I read him about the great cloud of witnesses and then I, and I showed him, uh, in John where the writ, the rich guy and uh, Lazarus died. Yep. And so the rich guy was taken to uh, uh, Hades and La- and Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. Yep. Right. And there's a gulf between the two. Yes. And it, it leads you to believe that you can see into both worlds. Uh, uh, I may be off on that, but I think it's possible that for sure – Hell should be able to see us enjoying Jesus <laughs> to add to the punishment. I mean, that's, and I may be just a, I don't know, <laughs> I, I, I may be off, but I don't believe so. So I explained to him, I said, here's how it's going to roll out. Your baby and me will be with Jesus mm. because you were born again. When that baby died, that's safety for the child. That baby's safe. The Bible says that the children are saved by the care, by the believing of the father and the mother. I said, so you can you can say and do what you want now, but for me and that baby, yeah. we're gonna be with Jesus. That's right. And if you decide you're not because it's too heavy of a burden for you. I, I do get it. I am sorry. I don't like it. But I'm not going I'm not going to cash in my chips. Mm. I'm going I'm going to try to figure out how to manage my emotions and keep walking with Jesus. That's it right there. And 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 he, boy he got mad at me about about saying that as well. And and I just took it anyway. I said, "But what I believe the Bible is saying that that if we choose the demon trail, that the punishment is eternal. Mm. And if we choose the godly trail, the victory is eternal, even though we may suffer here. And so... He reached and took the Bible back from me. And he said, you're going to be here. I said, I won't be here. And I've kept my word. I've stayed the course with him. Yeah. And he said, all right. Then we pray together. So we get down on the floor together and we pray and we weep together. <clears throat> we uh, manage a little bit of our emotions. We take a few breaths. 
um, because there's no one to blame. Yeah. Uh, the enemy, of course, we want to lay a charge on him. Of course we do. All right. So what happened next, then because I was able to convince him to take another breath and let's keep walking away further down the trail, he said, I need you to, I need you to come and pray for my wife. She's not going to make it either. I'm not, I'm going to lose her. And then we'll have to bury two. Yeah. I said, okay. So I go into the next house and boy, there was blood. You know, it was rough. And she's wrapped in a towel. She's, she's an idiot. She don't have recourse. Yeah. And she's embarrassed. And she's, uh, she's, you know, it's, it's, it's harsh. Life is, it deals with sometimes fairly negative ideas. And I'm not the guy that's going to look for who brought on the punishment, why, what doors, what the, I'm not, I'm not looking to lay blame. What I'm looking to do is be successful in my walk and my journey with who God puts in my path. Yeah. And so we we prayed for her, and she didn't, I mean, it didn't, she was still hurting because cramping and trying to pass the placenta. I mean, it was rough. Blood mm. was everywhere. It was, it was awful. Mm. And uh, so... He said, so let's go bury my baby. So we did. We went dug a hole, buried the child. See, all these things everybody sees me talk about and all these victories I talk, I talk about because I don't get in public and talk this very much. Yeah. It's just not a subject. It's just not what I do personally. But to me, the greatest victories are, of course, the healings. Of course, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. Thank you, God, for it. But it's the ability to take the punishment that none of us want. Mm, so good. And be able to believe and trust that mm. Jesus is king anyway. Yes. And and the whole thing about getting a shovel. Go and dig a hole. Yeah. <clears throat> and burying our dead. And then bringing the shovel back. And um, and then taking a breath <sighs> in the next step. Mm. That to me is what the walk is. Yeah. And so it was, it was hard, it's harsh, it's uh, a lot of negative involved, it's lots of uh, punishment in your mind, because uh, I'm, I'm a real positive person, Yeah. and I don't talk negativity hardly, uh, very rare, I just, I try not to at all, and, but at the same time, I face reality, and a lot of times it's with a shovel. Mm. And that's not a popular topic. Yeah. But it's a necessary it's topic. Necessary. Yeah. Because here's what happened. Uh, now, now that we're now that we're a few years down the trail past that, okay, let me let me back up to where we were with the death. And I went home. I got to exempt myself from the from the the the, the presence of the actual suffering. Right. And I got to go home and hold my family, and I was very grateful for their life and on and on. But the uh, probably, I guess it was 10 days later maybe, I went by to check on them, right? I was going to another village. I whip in to their village, and I go in, and the lady uh, met me uh, when I drove up. I got out and walked up to their uh, home, and... <clears throat> she came to me and just weeping and grabbed my hand and knelt down on the ground. Thank you, Brother David, for the gospel. Mm -hmm. I said, what happened? She said, well, 
She said, I doubt if it was an hour after you left, uh, there was, it was like a, a hand uh, mm. grabbed the placenta and pulled it out of her. Mm. She passed it and cleaned up, and she completely healthy, uh, healed, the blood stopped. Come on, Jesus. God did us a miracle. Mm. Uh, we don't know why we lost a child. Uh, you can assume, you know, people can say, uh, you know, whatever they want. Uh, and it could be legit. Who knows? I, I ain't got nothing to say. I say that I'm grateful that Jesus healed her. And they've become, they're probably some of my closest friends. She's had two more children since. Mm-hmm. Now they've got great grandchildren. Uh, and and life has worked out. Yeah. Uh, the pain and the suffering that was involved was real. It was tremendous. It was harsh. Uh, my advice, take a couple of breaths and sit down. Mm. Cry it out. It's okay. Stand up and take that next step toward Jesus. It's really good. That's my advice. It's really good. And there's hundreds of stories, but that, that one, because now he's... Uh, He's a great great grandfather in the faith as well, like me. We're similar in age and so forth. Uh, and we're still together, still working together. He's running about 50 churches now. The work is what he's and there's several thousand converts. Uh, it's it's miracles flow. Mm. So does death. Mm-hmm. And we often sit with leadership and t- tell that story and talk it over and prepare younger people for the future, is, which is going to be awesome. Yeah. But it's going to be filled with hard knocks, hard aches along the trail as well. That's right. Because that's part of maturity. You would be, you would be, off, you'd be out of balance if you were just... Everything was just okay. You'd be out of balance. Because making you healthy is understanding that death and problems are just part of life that you have to go through. It, uh, and there will be a lot of people disagree with me because, because that's their opinion. And But this is not an opinion for me. As far as I'm concerned, it's part of the gospel. It says you will have in this lifetime, uh, you know, a hundred more moms and dads and houses and homes, and you'll have all that stuff, and it'll be beautiful. Yep. But it will be with persecution. That's right. That's the part that people leave out. I know, and and I'm not the guy that leaves it out. Right. Because I embrace it. Because if I don't, it will punish us, and I will lose people. That's right. That I consider valuable, which is everybody to me. That's right. So. No, it's good. I think one of the reasons we wanted to talk this through today is because there's such a focus on the <clears throat> blessing and all the good things and the power of God. And a lot of the times we're very positive destiny focused and we prepare ourselves for all that God has for us. And that's a perspective problem because sometimes we just think that's all the good things. And you got to look at Jesus. If God didn't spare his own son but was pleased to pierce him, then why do we believe that life's going to be a Disneyland super pass? You know, like you just said. And and I think that it's really important because I've watched us lose people that just have a belief. Good people. Real good people. Like the best. I mean. (sighs) That have this perspective that everything's got just great and God's happy and he's only going to bless. And he is. He is going to bless you, but there's this, like, I just, I've taken a lot of comfort in the life of Job. And while the devil did all the bad stuff, God picked that fight. And you can see the part that I really like about the story of Job, there's a couple of parts. There's one part, his friends are saying, look, buddy, tap out. This has gone too far. His friends have emotionally already buried him. They're like, this guy's cursed. He's gone too much. Just curse God and roll over and die. And I love his response. He's like, even if God slays me, 
Yeah. I'll still worship him. I'll still serve him. I'll still pursue him. Jesus and that, name. that's that is something beautiful. This is guys, this is before so much of what we call our modern revelation gives way to. This is a man that walked with God. But I really love that if you go to the book of James, you'll actually see that the end of Job's life was twice as blessed than at the beginning as intended by God. And so you see this destructive trail of pain and damage and loss and real deep stuff. Like we're talking family members, we're talking his businesses, just his own health, everything that you would consider to be valuable just being destroyed right in front of you. And the man just sits there waiting for God. Doesn't like it. No one wants that. No one's going to say, hey, yeah, that's a, that's okay. I'm just going to grip. Because the thing I've learned is that this pain, while the, it does come from the devil, it is weeding everything out of us somehow at the same time. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't belong there. But I really think that one of the things that I want to reach out to you, we want to reach out to you if you're watching this, and you're going through some significant pain, loss, trauma, whatever it is in your life at this time, <clears throat> is that the devil wants to weaponize your pain and do exactly what he did with Eve. He wants to turn around and say, this is God. God's trying to take something from you. God's forgotten you. God's trying to judge you. He's trying to bring these accusations to weaponize this pain that you're in. He caused it, and he's trying to give God the blame so that you'll swivel on God and step out like like your pastor did in um, for a minute there. He started to back out. And that 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 right there is just the thing that I want to grab a hold of you and I want to speak to you. And if you're struggling with that, I just want you to do exactly what Brother David just said. Just please just stop and pause. Because in a minute, the goodness of God's going to find you. And, and, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you look at people that do wicked things or they get away with real terrible stuff and it seems like their life's easy. And how come I stop looking at that, stop comparing them and just start looking at Jesus? Because this is the stuff that will trap you inside these moments where you're in pain and loss and disaster and chaos. Jesus is going to be faithful to you. We've seen it over and over again in our lives. I know you've seen it. You're further down the road than, than we are, but we've seen it. And in the moment of it, it's trying to pull you where you get to the point where you don't have anything else and you're ready to quit. It's trying to push you into the direction of quitting. But if you'll just, I've just found this place where I can't defend myself any more than he can. I can't protect myself. I can't provide for myself. I can't fix anything. I can't cover my name. I can't save that person. That's all Jesus. And I have to find a place. And I, I think it's amazing. And I think the story where Jesus speaks up and all the disciples are terrified. He's sleeping in the boat and the storm's going to sink. That They think is going to, and these guys are seasoned sailors and they think it's going to sink the boat. Yeah. And I think while most of us are looking at the story where Jesus stands up and says, peace be still. I think part of the thing that we need to learn is that Jesus was telling us a story that he was sleeping. He was at total peace in the middle of a storm. And that's that whole setting a table before you in this battlefield of your enemies, you know? And I, I think I, I, this pain, sorrow, suffering, loss, somehow it refines us. But it's not God trying to <laughs> exact something. The devil's coming to burn things out of our lives. To, to and, and a lot of the times, the more you lean into serving God, the, the <laughs> hotter it gets. Like I, I, I heard someone once and they, they, they said, well, you know, the further you are, the more mature you are in God, the less the devils can touch you. And I'm like, that is so untrue. Because if that was true, then why did the devil come to Jesus after he had fasted for 40 days? Why did he show up to try and disenfranchise him from the power that he was? He was it says when he walked out of the desert, he came out with power on him. And he was, he was in that place. There was power on him. And there was a, there was a devil, the, the devil tried to come and sabotage that process. And a lot of the time in suffering, while it does come from the devil, He's trying to sabotage you coming out into something, coming out into breakthrough, miracles, increase, and, and, and shifts. And so I just want to encourage you that if, you, if you're in something right now, it doesn't matter how little it is. If it's big to you, it's a big deal. And, and Jesus sees you. 
because sometimes you hear stories like, oh, someone's baby died or, you know, maybe you're having problems paying your rent and you feel like, oh, I don't know where God is, where are my finances? Or maybe, you, maybe you've got a sick person in your family and someone's, someone's in the process of not going to live if, if they don't get a miracle. It doesn't matter what your story is. It's if, if you're feeling <laughs> that pain and sorrow bearing down on you, it's a big deal to you. And it's not that we want to give way and coddle that thing because the minute, I think personally, self-pity is one of the most debilitating mentalities that anyone can have. And I encourage you not to get, not to get lost in the self-comfort of poor me because the minute you do that, the minute, that's the minute the enemy starts to get power of your life. You just got to keep turning to Jesus in that storm. Yeah. Um, there's another story. We have time. I like your stories, yeah. Okay, so I don't have a lot of experience with miracles and uh, how to manage the spirit realm, right? But God threw me at a, a seasoned, several thousand year old, mature, black magic environment, witchcraft, right? Right, right. All right. So I'm out there trying to find souls, trying to de bring deliverance to people who don't have a deliverer. And, and I, I apologize to the whole world uh, that, that because I feel clumsy. Uh, most of the time I feel awkward, inadequate uh, to do the job, but I am actually the only one there doing it. Mm. Okay. So I go out. I find this fellow in a cornfield. He got saved, and he, I'm explaining the gospel to him. He says, so your God can heal, huh? I said, he can. Uh, now, my experience with his ability is not who God is. Mm. Uh, he's creator God. Right. And my lack of experience does not control him. Okay. So he said, my, my sister-in-law's sick. And I had no, you know, I, there's no telling what it is. I said, we go and we walk in and there are these two witch doctors, uh, black magic warlocks sitting there and they're praying these chants over this person. And so then I'm there. And as soon as I walk in, there's this conflict in the spiritual realm. Okay, so it's uh, very negative and very positive. Uh, so it's going round and round. And uh, then you got this lady. She's laying there completely nude, but she's her her head is is twisted and on her back. Uh, uh, it's very odd looking, and her arms are twisted around backwards, and her legs as well. And so it's very uncomfortable. Uh, for uh, for me, I'm not used to being in that environment, um, and I have never seen God do anything like that. Okay, and so I I asked him for permission. They gave me permission. The witch doctors did. I take my Bible out. I lay it on the girl, the woman. I just started praying, explaining to them who Jesus is, who God is. To 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 my, to what I know, how I know it. Uh, um, and it must have been half an hour later, uh, we hear a bone pop. Mm -hmm. It's very loud because it's uh, it's fairly calm thing because she's so sick. You know, we're very, not very noisy. And um, bone pop, then another one, then another, then her arms straighten out. <laughs> I mean, it's just like a movie. I'm not kidding you. And, and her legs, then her head comes around. I mean, it's, I mean, it's weird. And I was sitting there looking at this miracle, watching it happen. And me and the witch doctors are side by side now. And we're all, they're asking me about the power that's doing it. I don't even know what to say. I mean, I don't have any experience with that kind of energy. <laughs> few, few of us do. I have more now, but then, and, and so, okay, so I was, to be ecstatic, that ain't even the right word, and I was blown in every direction, it's awesome, 
And then, of course, these witch doctors get saved. The whole family gets saved. Man, it's it's beautiful. We have instant church. You know, it's it's just, I don't know. It's awesome. Okay. But now then, now, talking about these, how life is, how these spirits are, how, okay, it, I'm fixing to bring up a very controversial subject. Okay. All right. Here we go. Because I want to talk about it. Let's go. Because it deals with this whole thing of pain and suffering yep. inside of a Christian atmosphere, right? When we are we are we are definitely promised freedom mm. from okay. satanic pressure, right? All right, and I accept it. Boom, hundred percent. I want it. Absolutely. I eat the bread. I'm done. Good. Okay. So I come home. Man, I'm excited. There's a miracle. You know, and I get in there, my wife cooks me a meal. I'm sitting there explaining this miracle to her, my kids, and man, we're all, yay. You know, it's what? And so about two o'clock in the morning that night, uh, all of a sudden my wife is waking me up. And whenever I turn the light on, the lady from the village. The way she looked, my wife is turning that way. Okay. That ain't legal. All right. And so I was in, uh, I was up at a, in the Harvard uh, medical thing, uh, uh, teaching, and these, there were these 600 uh, graduate students that I was talking to, and they're the ones that's smart, right? And so it turns out that what uh, the way I described it and how they called it acute spinal meningitis. That's what wow. they called it. It's deadly. I mean, it's going to... So my wife now looks like the lady from the village. Okay, so... How is that legal? It's not. All right. Why did it hit... My, my wife is... You know, if there's a good person, she's that. Which I don't believe in good persons, but... Right. She's a good lady. So how did that thing come? How did that come with me? Hmm. How? Okay, and so we we now, man, she's freaking out. The pain is amazing, all that, because she's she's contorted in such a way, and I can't, I can't, it, it'll break her if I pull much on her. Right. Right. If 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 we're only allowed the Disney World, right? Then I've I'm off course or something. Yeah, what box do you put that in if you're only allowed Disneyland? <laughs> All right. <laughs> But when you're in the middle of it, that woman's dying. Right. There isn't anywhere else to go. I don't have uh, somebody or a resource I can lean on that can talk me out of this or into something else, or that can I can where I can take her and get her fixed. Man, that's all the way to Houston. That's like twenty hours away if I took off right now. Uh, <clears throat> from central Mexico. All right. All right. So, so I started praying. I, I'm up all night now and there's no, there's no, uh, there's no, there, there's no softness. There's no curing. There's no, the pain is intense and it's second by second and it's intensifying. It's not backing down. It is spinning up. And then now we're late in the evening. It's been like 14 hours that she's been in this shape. Right. And I, I have to go, I have to go preach. Okay, now this brings up more controversy because she is the joy of my life. My wife, I love that lady. Mm. There's nothing I would do to hurt her or condemn her or... 
there is one resource, in my opinion, that's above her, and that's God the Father and the kingdom of God. That, But she is, in, in human standards, she is my number one. Jesus is top. Yeah. Okay, so okay, so it's complicated now. It is. So I've given my word to a village that I'll be there at a certain time to preach Jesus to them. Right. So how do you how do you become okay with leaving her? And going and doing what's my job, which is preaching the gospel. How do you make it okay with God that it's okay to lie to the people for me to stay with her when 100%, if you're married, if you love your spouse and your family, you understand that it's okay for them to be, be top priority. But I have to submit something else to you, and it's super controversial. I submit to you that obedience to God is greater than any other subject. Agreed. So how do you manage your emotions mm. when you're torn <laughs> completely into care for your family, Obedience for God. Mm. And see, this goes back to that. Because no one, no one, there I would I wouldn't get one email negative about saying I stayed with my family. Yeah. You wouldn't either. You, you, nobody would contest that. No. But I made the decision to be obedient to God and not be a liar. And to the people or to God. Right. But that meant leaving her. And she's in dire straits. Uh, she's dying. I mean, there's no way to recompense this. There's no way to put it in a, in a sequence where you can make it okay. And whenever I stood up to get myself dressed to go do my job, she immediately is telling me, I'm dying, I'm dying. And my wife is not a, she's not a, she's a tough lady, she's a good lady. She is. Beautiful. She don't want me to disobey God. She, she lived with me when I was not obedient to God. She don't want that. She wants submission to the authority of mercy. But to do that, I have to make a decision, and this is where it's going to get really controversial. You'll get mail on this one. Uh, I had to make the decision to obey God and the kingdom and go do a one or one and a half hour message and be gone from the house six to eight hours uh, do a service and come back or stay with her and pray her through our dilemma. Mm. And so we, I told, she had a secretary that lived there. I said to her, I said, look here, I don't need her to be alone, period. I need the kids in here with her praying. I need y'all praying. I'm going. And my wife is tripping. She's she's broken. She's hurt. She don't know what she's saying. She's she's delirious from the pain. She's it's a lot of things that are in play, right? But I made the decision. <laughs> Whether I'm right or wrong, we'll go ahead and let God judge that. And so. I stepped into it. I got out there on my big dirt bike. Man, I went to church. Doom. The whole way, you know what was being spoken in my mind. Hell was right here, yep. chirping. Ta -ta 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 -ta. 
lots of stuff. Yep. I get to the village, things are in disarray. It's it it's not even like it was programmed to be. Right. Uh and so then uh I'd finally got a chance to speak to a handful of people. And I preached probably one of the toughest healing messages I've ever preached, mm. pro- I would say. And I get back on my motorcycle and all the way home, this is what I'm told in my in my ear. You're coming home to a death. Mm. Your family is going to be destroyed. Mm. And so I have wow. to I have to say I drove it I drove that dirt bike straight through the front door. I never checked up. I, I hit that front door, it blew open. I went in the living room, did a donut. Man, I'm dripping mud. I'm, you know, I'm uh, who I am. So, sweat, sweat, and mud. And so, I get off. I get my gear off, and the kids are there, and everybody's happy, and I don't know what's going on. And I went and kicked the door open to our. Still got my riding boots on and that, and I kicked the door open to my bedroom, and my wife. <laughs> She's setting up and she's healed. Mm. And she says to me, thank you for obeying God because Mm. the moment your motorcycle cranked, God came and touched me and healed me. Wow. Thank you for being obedient to God. It brought healing to our house. Wow. And so that's how we began to accumulate understanding and energy and our walk and our definition of who we are, uh, our toughness, yes. abilities, gifts, it all comes through the suffering instead of the pleasure. Yeah, that's right. Because we're, we're, we're like the Word of God. The Word of God has been purified seven times. And for us to be anything less to me would be un unsafe sharing in his sufferings that's it pushes for me. you towards resurrection power right to me yep yeah and people can have all the opinions they want about what you should have done right but the reality is is the track record speaks for itself and in suffering sometimes if you've been feeding your emotional world instead of your spiritual life when suffering shows up and it's going to show up to all of us and sometimes it shows up with unreasonable amount of quantity or periodic instances, incidences. And the problem is, and that's why we've got to be walking with Jesus daily, because if you are veered off in your emotions when something shows up, not if, you're either going to operate from an emotional, soulish response or you're going to lean into what Holy Spirit is yep. giving you the key. And sometimes... You know, I haven't had anything quite that extreme yet as far as that that story, but I know that there have been instances where you get into pain, you get into major pressure, major sorrow, major loss, and your emotions are screaming at you to do one thing, coupled probably inspired by the devil, to be honest, because he's trying to get you off the path that God has. And yet over here, your spirit is sometimes getting a leading to do something that seems abnormal, but it's the right thing to do. And that's the difference. You can't you can't do a 21 day fast on the day you need the on the day you need those results. They have to be preloaded. And you've got to you've got to have a spiritual life that's been pre-fed consistently walking with Jesus. Otherwise you're going to get into situations and especially if you're in a, a culture that just just goes after and celebrates and talks about this Disneyland Christianity and that's just not a real thing. We got too many shipwrecked people out there that are living a life with expectations of this kind of wonderful world of Christianity. But the reality is, is in this life, you are going to have trials, wow. testings, tribulations, chaos at times. And yet that's not an absence of God. Sometimes it's the very proof that He's there. <laughs> it's the very proof that the enemy's coming to test your guns. He's trying to come to test your resolve. And 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 somehow in that God's allowing that. And if we endure to the end, we get saved. 
And that's the thing is there's an endurance. We want to invite you to have an endurance in Jesus and not quit. Not, I think sometimes when we have a gospel, like, you know, people will stand up and say, God blessed me and my business has just made a million dollars. And we think about that and we're like, okay, cool. The blessing of God is connected with me doing well. Well, if that's true, then the absence of blessing means that God hates you. <laughs> so that's a false doctrine. God does bless you, but he doesn't just call, <laughs> rain falls on the just and the unjust, the godly and the ungodly. And and the problem is, is if we hold to this idea that, well, the the proof of God's love and blessing over my life is nice things happening and prosperity and, and good things. If, if we live that then, and we really believe that doctrine, then we're going to short circuit. And I just want to invite you back into the middle. It's like, hey, we contend for, I was just sharing, like we just lost someone this last week, this last couple of weeks, and we were contending for them. We're contending for more people. And the reality is, is that whether we get a miracle or not, I, I don't ultimately have control over the miracle. I have control over believing God and declaring his goodness and contending on heaven and releasing heaven's power that's been put on our lives, the keys to the kingdom that have been given to us. But I don't always have the ability. I don't believe anyone has the ability to guarantee that. So if we get a miracle or if we don't get a miracle, Jesus is still in control. He's still king and we still worship him. And I think sometimes learning to step into more maturity sometimes looks like, the, and, and it's really keys in perfectly with that first story you told, is that, when we don't get a miracle or a curveball happens, like what happened with Mrs. Hogan, Jesus is still on the throne. And so this might be new to someone watching this. This might be completely controversial or left field for maybe what you've been used to being taught or you've seen or you've watched, modeled and demonstrated. But I want to invite <laughs> you, if you look at the life of Jesus, he had a life that actually was very difficult. He had a life of, it says, Jesus was a man of sorrows. It talks about it in Isaiah 53. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was afflicted and stricken, and we esteemed it like that's just God's judgment on him. And, and I think sometimes we just see happy Jesus painted <laughs> in our culture, and that's not necessarily right. Jesus is full of love and mercy and grace and goodness and all the power for all the miracles and the provisions we need. But, the, but there's, a, there's something he modeled that we can take up our cross. If it's his yoke, that means that it, really it's his discipleship over our lives. And if he walked through it, that means there's grace for us to walk through it. And I just want to encourage you that even though there's a cross and a grave, there's resurrection in whatever situation we walk into. And so this has been awesome. Is there anything you want to add? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, we're, we're just going to land here. I hope this has been a blessing to you. And I just really encourage you. When storms come, lean into Jesus and don't let the devil separate you. Lean in and find him. And sometimes the way that we feel that we want to respond isn't the right way. <clears throat> breathe and let get, You told me once when we were going through some really tough stuff, you said, breathe and give God a chance to speak. Just stop, pause yourself and, and let, because in the moment, it, it really invokes fight or flight. You're either going to run in fear or you're going to, roll up in aggression on something. And and I think that right there is the ultimate distraction because really what that means is I'm in control and I can fix this or I can respond to this, but that actually pushes God to the side. And that's not living as a submitted son or daughter of God. And so there's there's discipline in that and there's, and there's the release of you sometimes having satisfaction of the way we want to respond or the way we'd comfort ourselves in a response. But being able to step back and just go, okay, God, um, you told me once, you go, go sit under a tree and wait for God to speak to you. And that's helped me in life. And I, I just extend that to you. Just when stuff hits and it's going to hit, like you are not going to have a life where everything's great for the rest of your life. I, I wish I could tell you that, but that's just not true. There is a storm coming at some point, maybe sooner than later for some of us. And when it comes, let's all just sit and wait on Jesus and have him show us how to walk this thing out. Hope this has been a blessing. So grateful to have Brother David here with us today. And if this has been an encouragement, why don't you throw a comment in, in below? And uh, we just we just speak life and the grace Jesus. and the blessing and the mercy of God over you in your life and your journey. In Jesus' name. We'll see you again. God bless. <laughs>